Oh yeah. So, sorry, I mean I have not unmuted myself. Uh, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to Women Techmakers Mysuru's inaugural launch event. Uh, the afternoon session is about a masterclass session on uh, privacy in ML. And uh, we have our women Google developer expert with us, uh, Sharmista, and she has a decade of experience in ML. And uh, so a little about Women Techmakers Mysuru and GBG Mysuru. Uh, we are expanding our team and we are looking for volunteers because we are connecting events every week. We connect events in Google Developer Technologies and in uh, open source technologies. If you wish to speak in the one of our meetups, then you can reach out to me in LinkedIn or in Twitter. My Twitter handle is uh, urengaraju. Do follow me on Twitter. And if you're interested in being uh, volunteering or being part of the team, you can contact uh, Nikhil. His email ID is there. There's also a core team member here, uh, Kevin. You can also reach out to him if you want to be a part of the core team. And uh, the community partners for the event are Co-Learning Lounge and Applied Singularity. You can actually uh, download Co-Learning Lounge. Uh, you can uh, subscribe to their channel and download Applied Singularity app. Uh, they have wonderful data science resources for you to get started. Um, so without further ado, I would uh, like to ex uh, hand over the session to Sharmista to give you a session on privacy, masterclass session on privacy in ML. Uh, over Hi, to everyone. You. Yeah. I'll stop my video. On. Are you able to hear me clear and loud? Hi, yeah, I'm able to hear you. Yeah, I'm able to hear Usha, you. are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're able to see my screen as well, right? Uh, you're able to see my screen as well, right? Yeah, I'm able to. One minute. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, you able to see my, are you able to see my screen as well? Yeah, I'm able to see your screen. Go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. I'm starting now. I'm Sharmishta. I'm I'm Sharmishta. I'm working as Senior Manager of Data Sciences at Publisher Sapient. And today we are here to talk about privacy in machine learning. I hold a master's degree in computer science and engineering from Aalto University. I'm also a certified professional Google Cloud architect. And Usha, as Usha has mentioned, I'm also a Google Cloud developer expert in machine learning. I've filed five US patents and have authored as in conference and journal papers. Here's my website, takeairesearch.com. So I've been blogging actively. There is my GitHub link where I have made some contributions on privacy and machine learning, differential privacy. And here's my Hackandoon profile where you can find a blog on uh, tensor, uh, differential privacy with TensorFlow. It's the, present in both the links. So let's start. What is privacy and why it's important in machine learning? As you have heard, the Satya Nandala rightly says that data privacy must be uh, seen as a human right. And that's why we are here to talk about the machine learning techniques that we should take care to build a privacy enabled, security enabled models. So today's agenda are uh, first, we will take a look at the privacy attacks and laws, then the life cycle of privacy in terms of machine learning. And then we'll go into federated learning with a brief introduction of TF encrypted then we'll introduce the concept of differential privacy, where are its applications and how you can use this to build scalable systems. And then how do we take those research uh, prototypes that people have done it in TensorFlow to production? How do we scale and build distributed systems with TensorFlow and, this, and differential privacy? So we see that our companies are data safe, not at all. Facebook has paid around $5 billion fine for breaching customers privacy in private information. Equifax, British Airways, Uber, all in all different domains, we see they have these vast companies have ended up paying millions of dollars fines as their systems have been compromised and users' information have been leaked. So there is no escape without having stored confidential information either in big data or if we translate that to machine learning models. We see here again a NYC taxi data attack where celebrities' information have been co taken, compromised, and they have linked this celebrity personal information to the whereabouts where they're moving around, and they link those information and get details about their entire details. 
get got their entire details. These linking attacks are also present with fitness tracker heat map, they, where military uh, confidential information were gained. Netflix as well as IMDb. Everywhere we see that some kind of information is available in one source and attackers have been able to uh, link this information to uh, ratings in other, another source and they get a very large, huge data set of the cu customer's private and confidential information. And what are these attacks? So the attacks are extracting features from the raw data. And after the feature vectors are extracted, they train the machine learning models and give the model output. And from the model output, they try to, once we have the model outputs and the models deployed in cloud, they try to do model inversion attacks. They're getting information from the output of the model. They extract the feature data in a completely black box manner without having any knowledge of the machine learning hyperparameters or the input weights, how they have been trained. And once they have been successful with the model inversion attacks, they try to do reconstruction attacks. That's white box attacks. That's SVM and KNN are most susceptible to. Once they have gained access to the feature vectors, they use the feature vectors, and then they use reconstruction attacks to gain complete information of the actual training input which have been used in the models. That's how it works. And we have also inference attacks where they train target models, where they, we train target models and the attackers train attack models. So we can also design our uh, attack models and see how good is our model when it is comes uh, in terms of privacy. And with the class level and prediction, once we train the attack models, we can use the attack models to uh, attack the machine learning models deployed in the cloud. I'll show you this, how it works. So again, we have standalone membership inference attacks. That is, they train on two. When one they try, once the user have trained the data set, they use two different data sets to gain information about the predicted outcome. So the model is in the cloud. They use data set one, D one, and D two, and see the predicted outcomes. And they, they use this delta information between D D one and the predicted outcome, say F, F delta, and try to infer that what training input has what uh, input into the model gives the delta d output so by this they try to infer that in the data points that have gone into the model during training then federated learning attacks so what they do they try to attack systems where there are a lot of learning happening between clients within a centralized server so as we know that stochastic gradient descents we try to uh, minimize the loss to uh, by minimizing the gradient so they try to identify which data members have gone into the training, how they do so. They try to reverse the direction of the gradient minimization. Once they identify for this data points, I can reverse the training direction. I, I, the model doesn't go back, it go, is not converging. I'm putting the gradients in the ascending direction. They try to modify uh, the model. They try to get the access to the entire training data points of the model. And why this is important in, in, in for us to know the machine learning privacy laws, the laws which have come up with individual countries and continents, because other than that, if, even if our systems and storage devices comply to GDPR and the ML models are not, we will end up paying fines like these companies have ended up. So these are the different laws that individual countries have, China, EU, India, Brazil, US. So these laws ask us, to protect customers' integrity, confidentiality, authentication, authorization, and non repudiation And all the models should be available 24 cross 7. So you see, the laws have become very much stringent for protecting customers' users' data. US, EU, and they have defined frameworks how people can communicate between inter-countries. So EU, US has privacy shield framework that, that defines how individual countries' uh, customers' data will flow. And violations will end up going in jail. So what is the help? We should abide by the global law, data and privacy laws rather than ending fines. So I'll build more resilient, low impact and secure systems so that my ML models are secured. And how we do it, how do we do that? We do we can have definite frameworks like machine learning lifecycle and the what are the some of the techniques available while training the models that help us to do so. So you see, first we get the data from different contributors. 
different IoT devices, mobile devices. And once we gather the data, we aggregate the data, we cloak the data, we store them, uh, anonymizing the data. We'll see the anonymization techniques. And once we anonymize, we aggregate and we add noise. The second step is aggregate from multiple sources and adding noise to the system. So there are me uh, mechanisms like K anonymity, I diversity, T closeness. So, so once we do that, so we once we do that, we aggregate and send it to the data modeling. And the data modeling system continuously predicts and corrects its learnings. So if it had made a mistake, it corrects it. And then it forecasts. It forecasts based on the predicted outcome the model has built. And this continues in a loop. So everywhere I assume that the, my information has to be stored in an encrypted or it has to be anonymized or it has noise has to be added to the systems. Now let's see that, that how we can do that. So here, if you can see my screen, I have a k-anonymized uh, data. So we have like a data set which has age, work class, education, uh, all this race, sex, uh, income. So we are going to anonymize this income because people should not know my correct income. So I anonymize it by making either a mask like five zero dash 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 or putting into certain groups. And how do I do that? We can do that in by using a partitioning algorithm so that I uh, distribute incomes from different groups into different partitions. I split them into groups. And if you see the split function, I, this all links will be shared, don't worry. So this uh, the users will be grouped into different partitions. And then they will be grouped into the, they will, won't be possible to know the exact income. So it will be into subgroups. Then I diversity is what is that if you see here i diversity is we try to maintain diversified groups so we we are more interested in splitting into two different classes for the same set, uh, for the same kind of people so a it and education you can see almost belongs to same same subclass of uh, integer number real value numbers 17 and 7 but there are split into less than 50k and greater than 50k similarly i go and continue continue to make the groups so idea is to make the groups as diverse as possible and this is not enough because even diverse groups might end up having uh, much of the data in one subgroup. So to to eliminate the problem, we use T closeness. So that what happens in T close T closeness? So the partitions which we have made and anonymize the data that each individual partition should behave as a whole to the entire gen generic data set. So that's how T closeness is implemented. So none of the groups exhibit any different characteristics than the whole group. So that's how we computed it. And this it looks like this when you plot it. Now let's go back to the slide. So this is how we maintain our anonymization. And we'll go talk about perturbation techniques. Uh, how does that happen? And how do we classify? We, we know that we will, add a, we will use privacy preserving machine learning techniques. What are the different categories of techniques? So we have to do, on, not only on the training side, we have to be using privacy on the inference side so that my inference data is not available to public so they can't sniff into the attacker cannot sniff into my network and get the predicted outcome so this is parameter based in the parameters like while we train we do the do the incorporate privacy and how do we that, do that we'll see that and during transmission like sending the model weights or selling the input data from the clients to the server we should incorporate privacy and there are cryptographic like a privacy preserving in the inference. We can encrypt it. There are various encryption techniques, obfuscation techniques, and multi-party data distribution techniques where privacy should be incorporated. So look, and while we do that, we can go into very much personalized models. We should encumber parameter parameter-based uh, privacy techniques as personal models as well as distributed machine learning. And while we do so, we add anonymization, we add cryptographic techniques, we add data synthesis techniques, like we generate synthetic data, which can, which behaves similar to the normal data. So the attacker has no clue which is the real data and which is the fake data, and different data synthesis techniques. And while we do that, for what things we do? 
we do for personal very very much confidential information like name address social security indirect identifiers like my medical records where i'm living my date of birth geolocation and the information that can be linked to multiple individuals like the sensor data my movie preference suppose i have i they can link information as we have talked about through linking attacks i have rated some movies in imdb but getting similar kind of users as me they will link my information and they will try to get information about other users so we, we have to apply our training models security in all so that they are secured from all different sources of attacks and what are the perturbation techniques the noising techniques we are going to add so we can either add gaussian or laplacian noise to the input covariance matrix the pca right when we compute when we do dimensionality reduction or pca we can add noise to the input right at the input before we train our models so suppose think about a situation like we are doing anomaly detection so we add noise and then uh, once i reduce the dimension add noise and feed it to say one plus sbm to get the anomalies or outliers we can even add noise at the and in the weights like like the differential private solutions they do in the in the covariance matrix of the pca during the weights model training we can add the noise we can even add noise at the generated output say think of a situation like uh, we will talk about that bolton differential privacy where where the input relationships between all the features are preserved and adds noise at the output so that will give uh, before giving the prediction results out to the client so that will add sufficient noise and anonymize the predicted outcome even we can add noise to empirical risk minimi minimization problems and so the your objective function as a whole the way we have plotted you see on the left and right one is without noise and one is with noise so the the categorization of the class is preserved but the the way the predicted outcome comes is very different than the original outcome and so here you see input versus output perturbation what is the difference so here directly add the weights and to the weights w are the weights with it gets added in an s model why is the predicted outcome in u1 u2 u3 are the noise so before model training you are adding noise and after model training you are noise adding noise so this is the two difference between the input and the output perturbation what are the attack mitigation strategies now we will talk about machine learning and when we train the models how can we train them so that the attacks are minimized and we are more safe from the attackers so restrict the prediction vector to top k classes so need not be going to 100 classes when they can be grouped and predicted in terms of 10 classes so restrict it to the most top most 10 classes portion the prediction probabilities or classification probabilities instead of say logistic regression or random classifier predicted 0.00456 restrict it to two places of decimals round it up then increase the entropy we know the entropy of anything increases uh, adds more disorderliness adds noise to the system so if we can increase increase the entropy by adding some kind of noise into the while training the model that will make our models more safe and robust and adding regularization we all know that l1 or l2 regularization the lasso ridge and elastic net the combination of l1 and l2 we should be very careful in choosing the regularization so that the model doesn't overfit if the overfitting it has been seen that overfitting is one of the main sources of machine learning models being get getting attacked by attackers and also in deep neural networks what we will do we will use the dropout dropout 0.2 0.3 what we do is to drop out the excess neurons so that it doesn't the model doesn't overfit so we should be very careful about regularization when we are thinking of deploying our models to production and these are more, more some of the tools like the I, ibm has come up with adversarial robustness toolbox uh, python toolbox for uh, the full box there is and there are uh, adversarial techniques of adding noise ad with pytorch library so these are the popular things it's very simple to use you can integrate and add noise to your inputs so that the data inputs or outputs or into the weights so that your data is completely uh, the in originality of the data is completely lost and the attacker is not able to gain any information of the data original data 
and what are the federated means uh, federated learning as you know that uh, it's uh, like a number of clients are there and they all do their own learning and they share the learning and they put the learning to a centralized server and the centralized server will learn from the individual training inputs they it will create a more centralized model and then we will push to the individual clients and that we can that can be done with tf encrypted this is the tensorflow library coming which has already come and with tf encrypted now let's see what's the difference between training of normal input data and tens with tf encrypted so we see, see that it's normal we just import the tensorflow as tf and we just provide the weights and we just add a uh, tensor operations like matmul add subtract and we get the in different layers and we get the predicted outcome and we just run it but in case of tf encrypted where you want your uh, inputs to come in terms of encrypted fashion it, or anonymized we have to inclu uh, include this tensorflow encrypted library and once we after we load the weights we can add noise here we can add, and we can also do encryption over the weights or the inputs then how that will work you will have a, a I'll, I'll show you more examples of tf encrypted how it works so you have a bias and weight and you and the model owner model owner is go, who is going to train the model and should have the weights and she, he would give the weights in an encrypted fashion and the clients will also give their predicted uh, the model input so that has to be fully uh, obtained in a private fashion and there's the encryption coming in and once we have the deep, deep neural network trained uh, with different layers do with the tensor operations we will do the define output the output has also been to be uh, uh, trained uh, means given uh, so that somebody can consume the clients can consume in terms of a uh, encryption technique so the input that's the main thing the input the output as well as the weights can be encrypted and should be encrypted while in case of a federated learning so here you see a more example of the code i've tried to give a snippet so like the data owner has a model and and there can be several data owners who train who is getting think of a much of a distributed scenario where number of clients are there somebody is community to data owner one somebody's two so the data owners are consolidated the models from the clients and they do it through the encryption and here they uh, this private input they get the gradients or the and the weights and they compute the gradients from the individual clients and then they aggregate the model gradients so they all, all the gradients that they get from in different clients they aggregate the gradients and then they output it when the training happens this iteration and the training happening uh, and they aggregate that and define in terms of a well defined that player who is going to distribute the data owner who is going to distribute the model update the model with the aggregated gradients the inputs uh, the encrypted inputs the model gradients and this so that they can define a uh, once the training has obtained they can again encrypt it and distribute it to the client now let's take a look in a code snippet how it works sorry one second. yeah Here, yeah, you see, you have to in, uh, import the ten, TensorFlow encrypted library, integrate with TensorBoard, and you define the input and whatever value you want to give, give it. And then you s compute the value. And when you execute it, you have you can enable uh, optimization. You may not enable optimization. And then you, you can visualize it with the TensorBoard. But where is the encryption coming in picture? Yes. So here is the once, once you call this function, so TFE will under uh, t take it to inside the TensorFlow library. They, they are applying that anonymization, the encryption techniques. So if you also look at here, security, uh, securely if you are building a uh, model, right? So this is with uh, this is with uh, TensorFlow encrypted, and they are say you are trying to build a secure model. And then once you have built the model, you have to distribute. So here you have to have a secure ne neural network uh, protocol. They have defined it, which we can use to distribute to your clients. And once you are the server is set to that secure protocol, the server you will start the server. You have started the server, and this they will. 
they will try to listen to the clients so that the encrypt the it's able to understand the encryption that the data it has received that it is receiving from the client so the cl client and server should know the, the mechanism of exchange so the secure data secure data input that the client is sending the server should be able to understand and we have, we start the server and we start the client so it will consume and it will respond to that uh, client's input And how they communicate, the mechanism of communication between the client and server is a FIFO queue. So if you see the private input, whatever it's there, the client will send it to the FIFO queue and the server will pull it for the FIFO queue. And from the FIFO, the server is trying to get the weights because there are so many clients. The client server has no clue who, who's sending what. So he has to listen to some uh, distribution channel for the updates. So it listens from the channel. It's adds it does its own computation the learning the server will do the all, all the computations and it sends back the output to the back to the client it's, it's with the tensor board let's go back to the slide yeah so what are the what are the cons or privacy challenges that we can that we can see from this uh, uh, from this mechanism give me a second Yeah. So you see, encryption is a very expensive operation. And in federated learning, every model has to say, say their inputs or they want to give some specific their gradients from they want to the server. So this is a network heavy operation and you're applying cryptographic techniques, right? This is a very heavy operation. And then the model has to be trained on the centralized server. There is a central dependency and it has again to be pushed. The encryption techniques has to be pushed pushed the encrypted models has to be pushed to the clients and that's network heavy because once in normal data if you think of so many clients participating in a crowdsource network sending the data to the centralized server itself is a heavy operation yeah, yeah. so and then how 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 do we handle those kind of situations we we take this that there are global updates there are local updates and the data transmission in ml like distributing the data distributed the models so pushing down the models to the individual servers how do we do that so there is another thing that's come into place and that's being a very foremost research topic now that is differential privacy and differential privacy is built at an application layer so when you train the models you see that how we do we train them how do we add no add noise to them and how do we measure that my machine learning model is secured enough so let's look into go into the concepts of differential privacy so we, we try to generalize the data so first what for generalizing the data we have to know the statistical behavior of the data and we have to abstract the data so that once we have get got the generalized behavior, the mean, we made the median variance, we see that that none of my single individual data point is adding sufficient details that the attacker is able to gain that information or the attacker is able to information gain information about the rest of my data points so the kind of generalization that we are planning to add is is defined by differential privacy and that will help to pro prevent information leakage and that will help me to build scalable ml models suitable for large data sets so let's go and see how do we encode it to general patterns so that we can offer protection against differencing attacks linkage attacks and reconstruction attacks that we have talked about and how do we uh, confine how do we make secure each and, and and give more trust to customers by having their private in information more generalized. So see, there are two different data sets I show you. They are D and D dash. And in the left hand side, you see there is a picture of a lady and here is a boy. So if I try to replace this picture by this picture, and we will see that the model has to has been trained in such a manner that the attacker has no knowledge that in place of this picture now this picture has come into place so how that we define that in terms of mathematics say it is a distribution model v dash and this is a distribution model d and in they are so much close in terms of statistical distance that they are too 
very much close, right? So all the figures are same except the last one, the last left hand side one. And they are single individual. So they are so much statistically indistinguishable that the, uh, the output of the model is not able is also so similar. The output of the model is so similar that there is no chance of anybody understanding that this has been trained on data set D or this has been trained on data set D dash. And how do we measure the privacy? We measure it by in terms of privacy budget. So what is out that epsilon? So epsilon should be e to the e to the power epsilon should be less than one one data says distribution. A PR of A D dash is nothing but a distribution of this data set over the distribution of the data set T2. So the two, if we take the ratio of the distribution, statistical distribution of these two data sets, that should be less than e to the power epsilon, where the D1 and D2 all belong to S, that is nothing but real values set, set of real values. And how do we me measure sensitivity? Sensitivity is nothing but the amount of noise we are adding while training the models. So that can be given by the max of norm of D1 minus D2. And that's that's the whole. A very simple case of tosses. So if, you, if I know that my toss will give 0.5 or 0.5, I may not be able to disclose my information to the outside somebody asked me say uh, think of a number between 1 to 10 i will think of it but if somebody asked me to say a uh, choose between head or 10 i know that there's much information that he would know either i will think of head or i will think of tail so that's that's very generic 0 0.5 0 0.5 probability but if uh, if this, somebody asked me think of between 1 to 100 and then think of your answer so i know that some sufficient randomization has been done to my answer so i will try to give him the answer so this is the measurement that you will see that the output uh, measures the same. So that's the objective of enforcing differential privacy in the models. And if you see that in, in terms of the statistical distribution of your talk, if we think of loss in the in machine learning models, how do we do that? We evaluate the loss in the function on the input data. Once the input data goes to the system, we evaluate the uh, loss over the input data by measuring it with the predicted outcome. and we while we do that, we 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 add noise while we try to minimize the difference between the actual output and the predicted output. So once we add determine the error, we try to minimize the error, and while doing that, we add noise in the input. And not only do we add noise, we try to clip the gradients so that any individual data point does not have much say in computing the model gradients and in mod in computing the predicted outcome. So every individual point has something to say, but it's it should not be overweighted. Any single point should have much preference over the others. That's why we do the add the noise and do the gradient clipping. So we are prepping the gradients so that if uh, points or the records which have show much higher or peaks in the uh, gradient in the gradient, so they do not contribute any add any biasness or contribute add too much uh, value towards the predicted outcome. So that's how we do, and this continues over iterations and iterations, and then we get a model compute the final error. Uh, on model convergence and compute the privacy estimate that is the epsilon and based on the epsilon we'll say how much our model is secured and the rene differential privacy is nothing but a concept to define differential privacy and that the way it has defined that it is it is com it computes com cumulative cumulative value of measures cumulatively the differential privacy based on individual queries that are coming into the system and it tries to maintain, have a low privacy budget. Remember, our ultimate goal is to have a low privacy budget so that that can in increase the confidentiality of the model and more stricter privacy. And we can, so that we can apply it to heterogeneous data sets. We are able to generalize heterogeneous data sets. And mathematically, it is nothing, that, but nothing but it's called alpha. It's proven by a privacy order of alpha. We need not know, so if it looks complicated, just ignore that. We don't need it. Just remember, there is a randomized mechanism uh, that's mapped to real value numbers that gives two different, that can be applied on two different data sets, which is very statistically close, D or D dash, and the privacy order is alpha. 
such that they are very close and their predicted outcome is not indistinguishable in terms of the probabilities or classes or uh, say regression, whatever output we whatever outcome we can we want to have at the predicted site. That's that's the uh, rainy differential privacy should be less than epsilon, and we are we should also be careful that. or the model for which we are training ha has to understand that and that has to be resilient and uh, should be able to accept the trade off what we are going to have so we should define that we should have this much of uh, accuracy this much of privacy and we should not compromise one over the other so this This can come from here. This clients may choose to send its own model rates. That also can happen. I have not put it here. So again, the client will send the input training data, and thus uh, the model owner will send the encrypted model rates. It will get trained at the individual servers, and the server will push the result to the individual clients. And while where does this, the system start? The system will start not only from sending the data. The clients can also choose to have their own differential private algorithms. Suppose uh, in federated learning, it's not about always sending the data to the server. They can choose to initiate the initiation algorithm can have can be built from their own mesh, uh, ML systems in, into the clients. That is heavy operation. We understand, but sometimes uh, some personal uh, some clients may choose to have their own personalized models to start with. So there they will uh, enforce differential private algorithm building so that the, at the application level also the models which they have built on their own is sufficiently secured and made confidential before they share it with the a centralized server so the whole ecosystem is a hybrid approach using tf tensorflow encrypted as well as differential privacy and we we, we have seen while we have done some studies that this is more uh, it's it's a more uh, like a joint system of adding extra power to the ml models and there are several differential models available uh, for tensorflow they have developed and which which are the basis of which it comes from paid that is the teacher assembles so privacy with private private aggregation so of teacher assembles that's the full form of it then what happens is that individual teachers they train the models and then the, there is an ensemble happening and the ensemble technique is nothing but adding noise to the system so the individual teacher assembles and that and the, that noise after the noise the predicted outcome you can pass it through a normal public network or a private vpn and this can work on both on trained and untrained public net, public data so you, even you can and uh, there are so many different versions of paid that has come up we can uh, i've put the links collected the links so you can go through then you will see that how they have evolved the paid model has evolved over time how they have selected the gradient this uh, gradient aggregator this is the gradient aggregator how they have evolved over time and how it become has become scalable like they can not only rely on this private data which is available but they also generate synthetic samples and and there are students which are learning from the teachers this is nothing but an ensemble network so these are individual models so they are they are again resize a student which is able to condense the information from the teachers and it only answers if it knows the uh, probably response from the teachers otherwise it tries to give a probabilistic answer so th this way, they have reduced the number of differential private queries. And remember, our main objective is to reduce the privacy budget. And as we lower the number of differential private queries, our privacy epsilon is going to get reduced. So the models which are more highly private and more secure are that have high teachers consciousness. Most of these ensemble teachers agree on on a certain set of generalization like somebody is asking for a class predicted outcome if most of the teachers vote for a class that obviously increases the confidentiality of the model and low privacy budget 
And now how we take that to production? So we have two different types of differential privacy. One is the global differential privacy, and other is the local differential privacy. So most of the industrial solutions you could think of are a, a, going by that local differential privacy. So they, why this? Because they believe that the, whomever I'm sending that algorithm is a trust is untrusted curator. Into in global differential privacy, what happens is they rely on a trusted curator and the trusted curator is nothing but he is responsible for adding noise by rece after receiving data from the individual uh, contributors but for local the ind individuals are very much skeptical and they add their own noise before sending into the global system and the untrusted curator also adds his own noise it makes a double layer and that sends out the part of data to third party and how there are certain uh, deployable solutions available like the uh, chorus network uh, which which has been built by uber that is a very much differential privacy incorporated and it is a very efficient and very easy to integrate so we can look at uh, chorus if you are trying to build uh, differential privacy in a large scale and i'll give you an example of iot how in iot domain how do we use it so here you see that the, the lot of data coming to crowds crowd data sensing and uh, crowdsourcing and the volume, veracity, and the variety of the information are different. And from edge devices, we are collating the data into a cloud. And while we are doing that, we add sufficient compression techniques because again, you, these are power hungry devices. They should allow, they should add some noise and they should compress their models and then send it to the server. And then they, the data is obfuscated and the reconstruction happens only after when needed, because when we, they need to look at the actual data for any any uh, technical purpose then only the data will be uh, un unanonymized otherwise the data will be always compressed obfuscated and it will continue in a loop and this way the server this eight servers can be tpu enabled you can train it in google cloud with tpu enabled servers and th this has the following features like it will stream it you should be able to stream the data and what we are aiming at the output is you distribute with uh, the cloud data proc, which is nothing but a similar kind of a spark kind of a distributed systems. And when we de deliver it to the cloud, uh, the outside world, it should be lightweight and it should be collaborative. Like we may want to have several differential private algorithms composed and distributed to another one. So it should have a composability feature, means we should design and deploy the algorithm in such a way that APIs and the microservices are able to talk to each other and define a composite model and use it to the best. So that's how it works. Even the cloud servers at the output perturbation we have talked about. Again, after distributing the trained models, if they want to add more noise to the system, they are free to do so. So individual collaborating hubs will be there that can distribute finally to the individual, mo mo individual mobile devices or IoT. In terms of how do we do that, I'll show you one example. The main objective is clear. So privacy versus, versus utility trade-off, and that should be defined as per business. What is my acceptable trade-off that I'm going to uh, apply? So we will add noise to the gradients, and we'll clip the gradients so that no individual has much to say in the predicted outcome. And why we do so, we have group of vectors, and why we apply micro batch and mini batch concept. So there is a one batch size we already know that in deep learning models we have a batch size so that in stochastic gradient descent we don't train the entire data. We do in terms of batches, and over that in TensorFlow privacy we are applying uh, mini batch size, so micro batch size. So this is further more granular. It gives me a further more way to control the gradients and look at the individual points. So whatever noise I am going to apply, then you have to define the loss function, and which is built over uh, the existing loss functions that they can pass categor categorical entropy or soft categorical entropy. And then you have the op optimizers. Optimizers are also built on the existing uh, uh, optimizer, Gaussian optimizer, Adam optimizer. But here they, are, they will be calling the DP gradient descent optimizer. Why? Because it's differentially private. It is not like normal stochastic gradient, gradient optimizer. And you see that the way we uh, apply that, we should we should be always using the vector loss compared to the scalar loss, this, because the scalar loss will not make our, my, my solution differentially private. And there is a privacy ledger. Ledger means that means that keep keep on computing the privacy cost applied to each and every individual query. I'll show you an example how do we do that. And there is a softmax layer. Softmax from logic is equal to true. 
that you should always take care. If you are applying your own softmax layer, then don't put this to true because it doesn't give you better results. So you can only put it true when you are there is no softmax and you're finally computing it to the adding the losses and putting your optimizer. We'll go for the demo. We do the accounting procedure. We do the uh, training, and we estimate the loss and the. Uh, one second. So here you see how do we do that? It's running in a collab notebook. So we have we have taken the MNIST data set. We have to reshape it into uh, the format that, that that allows it to fit into mini batches and micro batches. So you should be very careful about this reshape size because this TensorFlow uh, privacy is yet to develop. The, what the version they have released is 0 0.3. So the, this comes with an added complexity that if your reshaping is not fine, then you will run into complexities. And the most important thing, it does not work with TensorFlow 2.0 or 2.2. So you have to be TensorFlow 1.1.4 .1 or 1.1.5 to run this, this model. And when, after you have built this model, as you have talked about, see the L2 norm clip. This is the norm clip where you want to clip your gradients. That the gradient, how do you clip your gradients? So that has to be defined here, the norm clip. The noise multiplier, how much noise you are going to add. The micro batches, the, and then learning rate. That, this, is simple. this is same as your deep learning model. And once you have trained it, I've trained it. And the, this is my validation accuracy. And now we have to measure the privacy that epsilon we have talked about. So that privacy budget will nothing but that is depends upon your batch size, noise multiplier, epochs, delta, and the and the number of training samples you have taken. So this is uh, th this is cl closely related to delta. And this what is delta? That is the bounds, the probability of the privacy estimate that they are, your privacy maybe maybe bounded by some number so what's that number without that you cannot sacrifice your model so and that is inverse of your uh, training data set that's it that's you can define you can pass it the size of it the delta so that has to be inverse if you see there, there are sixty thousand samples and that is one one e to the power of five okay like for 10 times more than its inverse and we, once we co compute the, the epsilon we we know that what's the my privacy estimate of my uh, model and you need not get worried if you have too much high data sets that your privacy is uh, the budget is increasing it it may differ based on kind of the model like the number of data points in your model and what is the limit that the business is accepting so all of a sudden if you get see a very high number like 0.5 it should be less than 0.5 so if you're seeing Greater than 0.5, I've got scared. No, just try to analyze from my business perspective what are my allowances and what uh, is it able to, is this sufficient generalization being added? Is it being able to protect? So that's the other thing what we should look at. And let's look at this. It's, so next is we could go into Bolton differential privacy. Why Bolton? because it is kind of ensembling the models and it increases customer trust. Why I will explain you. See, uh, see, think of different situations in retail domain where different, different retail stores are learning some different private information of the customers. Now, if the customers know that my information is secured, you can use the learning from us. It's kind of a transfer learning. You can use this information from one customer uh, uh, and apply in situations where the retail to stores remain, semen, remain similar or the customer segments are similar. So they apply noise at the output, like the output perturbation. And the gradient descent is accordingly applied on the noise on the output. So the input relationships, if you think of product and category, that is preserved. A product, a product has a major category and subcategories. The input relationships in the training data is all preserved. Only the noise is added to the output. So that gives more confidence that the before sending the output predicted outcome, there has been sufficient anonymization of the data. And voter privacy uh, is like very simple. It, is, it depends upon convex locks function, less runtime, and it how it does is projects the weights to a radial space and after each batch. And this kind of ensembling uh, the model with differential privacy is obviously greater than the so any individual differential private model. And it preserves relationship that I've told you and the sensitivity of the data, like the regularization in, uh, input of the pa regularization parameter at the input is also 
taken care of so that there are no overfitting. So value addition from differential private systems. What are these that, that build different models, different uh, kind of transfer learning. You apply different kind of uh, information, input gains, learnings, and combine them for better privacy performance. And we have talked about, and that will give more technical uh, confidential to the models. That for legal and marketing issues, we can sell our models better to customers. We, if we give them the assurance of privacy that we are following. And this is how we do it in terms of code. I just try to condense it. So this is simple without differential privacy. You can add a dense layer, activation function, and the regularization. And with a so stochastic gradient descent and binary cross entropy. Where what you do here in Bolton model, you just call the Bolton model. You and uh, import the TensorFlow privacy and just call on the Bolton model. And you apply the uh, L1, L2, as I talked about the losses and is very much taken care of and they they have defined their own loss function strong way this is a convex optimization problem and they strong convex op, uh, binary cross entropy and this is the normal tensorflow privacy with uh, gaussian optimizer that is the differential privacy so here we add what we have seen that l2 norm noise multiplier norm batches and the learning rate and what are these are some of the techniques we should hold on or we should follow while deploying models like more uh, understand the domain problem, the privacy world. How do you define my privacy? What are the budgets? What is the population statistics? How th that's based on business to business and loose coupling of data, trusted party removal of the trusted party information, and categorical and numerical queries will be there. So, uh, do we address them separately, adding noise, or do we uh, apply the same set sort of noising techniques to them? Random sampling. And this is how we deploy into the production. This is the last one. So, so you see cloud automobile, automobile you will be doing your all the cloud agnostic uh, training of the data. But where from the data comes from? For the original data is stored, think of a big data system, the data is stored here. And then you define the schema and logic of the data and how do you want to train and push it to cloud automobile. And then do the feature engineering, comes back, step number three. And then here in the original database, you store it. Or store it. That can be uh, your cloud, uh, like cloud SQL, or it is a uh, without no SQL database. So when you uh, store this, uh, your data is anonymized. I assume that following big data principles of GDPR, you anonymize the data. And when you use the data for uh, feature engineering, after you have done first round of feature engineering and mining and preparation for training, here you do the training part. You do the differentially private algorithms, or you distribute in terms of federated learning, and you and send store that into individual models individual models that the cloud is training the data owner in terms of tf encrypted that is training or the individual models that the uh, clients are, whether if they want to store it in somewhere they can store it and so you maintain individual tables not a single table individual tables and then you send the test data set here i have tried to put some of the open source market players who have developed open source tools for differential private algorithms that try it out all are available in the github link and this is the current and future research that's going on for differential privacy how do we incorporate that bit for anomaly detection problems multi-dimensional time series hadoop based architecture how can we make the spark ml more integrate differential privacy with smart ml so that it is integrated with the hadoop ecosystem what is the algorithm efficiency and then we talked about the hybrid approach so cryptographic techniques with differential privacy right selection of epsilon and delta multipartic sharing the trade-off and how do we do it with virtual clouding mechanisms so these are the these are the things which are turned under research the model weight compression the links questions Questions? Sharnista, I think we don't have currently any questions. And uh, yeah, you want to share the link to your slides in the comment section or something? Yeah, I can share. So they, nobody has any questions. I'll share the links. Yeah, yeah, you can share the link in the comment section directly. So anybody is able to follow? Or... Yeah, I think everyone was able to follow. Yeah. Is there anybody? Uh, yeah, there, there were people. I think right now they've left, I think, some of them. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, one minute, I got a private chat also. Okay, you have ch shared it in the private chat. But I'll just put it in the comment. Yeah. I'll share it. Yes. Okay. I'll put it in the wait, global wait. comment. You will have wait, to put wait. it in the uh, global comments. In the top, you will have an option for comments. Live comments, right? Yeah, live comments. You will have to share it there. I'm not able to uh, print it here. Okay, then I'll just share it for you. You have shared it with me. I'll just share your uh, uh, things. Uh, the hacker I, I, Yeah, tell me. Uh, so this article and the GitHub, I've shared it in the live comments. And I'll also mail the audience, uh, all the registrants, both the links. Yeah, both yeah. The and the, I will uh, and uh, send this slide to you or, I, or do, you, do you want me to upload in slide share? Uh, you can upload it in slide share and you can share the slide share link. Uh, all the three okay. links and maybe uh, all the registrants. Okay, okay, fine. All the registrants, yeah. How was it? How was it? It was okay or? It was a great session. Uh, thank you so much for uh, patiently sharing so many things, so many insights and the collab notebooks and stuff. And all the links to the collab notebooks, you have it in the GitHub URL, right? Yeah, so I'll share it here. It's it's available in the uh, Google uh, Google's. This is I have put it all the all the all the things in my slide. The references, yeah. no, everything yeah. is everything. Okay, okay. Then uh, great session, Charmi stuff. I'll just uh, uh, the word, I mean the conclusion. I think will be done by Kevin. I'll just hand it over to Kevin. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Charmi Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, ma'am, very much for conducting such an informative session. We have uh, certainly gained insight and learned some concepts on privacy issues in the field of ML. Uh, and uh, to everyone watching this video, I hope you all are doing well. And, uh, and I, I would like to thank you all for watching this video. And uh, we have more such uh, sessions coming up in the near future. We have a Firebase and an Android session on July 5th. So please stay tuned and stay safe and goodbye. Thank you.